So let me just introduce our three discussants who are Nancy Campbell, Ellie Irons, and Jennifer Whiteman. So I'm going to read some, um, as I said, some biographical information to let you know how incredible these people are. Nancy D. Campbell is professor and department head of science and technology studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. And she's a colleague of ours. All of these people are. <clears throat> she's author of O.D. Naloxone and the Politics of Overdose Prevention, which is an MIT press from 2020. Also, Gendering Addiction, the Politics of Drug Treatment in the uh, Neurochemical World, co-authored with Elizabeth A. Tour of Palgrave publication in 2011. Discovering Addiction, the Science and Politics of Substance Abuse Research, University of Michigan Press in 2007. The Narcotic Farm, The Rise and Fall of America's First Prison for Drug Addicts, co-authored with J.P. Olson and Luke Walden. That was in Abraham's Press in 2008. Using Women, Gender, Drug Policy, and Social Justice, Routledge, 2000. Nancy has a, a PhD in the, in, from the History of Consciousness uh, Department at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She gardens on land where she once converged Howden, Osani, Mohawk, and Scattercook First Nations. Um, not where she, where, where once was converged, sorry, those three nations. I'm a little tired. So forgive me for the, for the uh, misreads. Um, our next discussant is Ellie Irons. And Ellie is an, an interdisciplinary artist and educator living and working on Mohican land in Troy, New York in the USA. Working across media from watercolor paintings to unlawning experiments. She and she'll explain maybe some of that. She combines socially engaged art and ecological field work to explore how human and more than human lives intertwine with, with other earth systems. Recent work involves collaborations about and with spontaneous urban plants, AKA weeds, including co-founding the Next Epic Seed Library and the Environmental Performance Agency. Ellie received a BA from Scripps College in Los Angeles and an MFA from Hunter College at CUNY in New York City. She's currently a PhD candidate in arts practice at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, researching forms of artistic practice that cultivate plant human solidarity. She has participated in recent exhibitions about environmental art and activism, including the Department of Human and Natural Services at Nurture Art, Ecological Consciousness, Artist as Instigator at Wave Hill, and Unsettled Nature at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And then last but certainly not least is Jennifer Whiteman. And Jenny is a research scientist specializing in greenhouse gas inventories and life cycle analysis of agriculture, forest, and waste, and, and biosystems at Cornell University. Her art practice began in 2002 and employs scientific tropes to incite curiosity of biological phenomena and inform an ecological reflexivity. Her art has been commissioned by New York State Parks, featured at Lincoln Center, BAM, and Imagine Science Festival. I think I will just turn it over to you all. Thank you all. Um, Nancy, would you like to begin? I will call yes. on you. Thank I you. guess that I will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. you. Uh, first. Is, if that's all right, then I will go right ahead um, because I am eager to talk about these these works and this um, uh, attending to rural ecologies too um, has brought some of my thoughts into pretty crisp contradiction. And um, so I'm, I'm eager to discuss um, this. Uh, last night, Max LeBron uh, directed our attention to a letter from Eve Tuck um, that is called uh, Suspending Damage. And that letter, uh, quotes bell hooks and um, quotes something in which uh, bell hooks is saying um, basically we have been uh, particularly people of color have been asked to only speak from that space in the margin that is a sign of deprivation 
a wound, an unfulfilled longing. Only speak your pain. And so I put that out there um, on this relatively joyous day um, that I've spent with um, all of you um, because I'm always thinking, well, how do we interrupt the violence that has been visited upon so many forms of life and ways of livingness while not dwelling too long and deep on the harms of our damaged planet? You know, counting our losses, documenting our pain, putting our fingers on the pulse of the trauma, right? Um, and what Eve Tuck says is basically, uh, you know, stop documenting damage and start researching for desire because desire can kind of break, um, not only break, break the cycle between reproduction and resistance, uh, which is kind of isomorphic and leaves us in kind of a suspended state. Um, but we can also remember that which imparts joy and persistence, tenacity, and livingness. And so that's a hard thing to think together with because, you know, the flames are at our doors. Wild boar and foxes are crossing the streets of Berlin. I will never forget one night when I was walking home in, in Berlin, um, and there was a fox um, waiting as I was for the light to change so that we could cross the street together. I mean, it's really like that there. It's really very interesting. Um, you know, layers of industrial ruin are becoming our very gardens. Rubble is our growing medium. You know, so how do you in that kind of state rework the grounds on which we stand and make and do in non-extractive ways? And I think we've seen some real examples of that, including what I, uh, what Bettina brought uh, to us um, in the form of an ethnography. And I'm so sorry that Natasha Myers wasn't here because she calls these sorts of things, you know, ungrittable ecologies, the ones that refuse the common sense narrative, right? The teleology that we all have in us of colonialism and militarism and heteronormativity and economizations of life that feed those forces of reproduction. Um, so, you know, we're living with the culmination of hundreds of years of this sort of extractive scene. And we have a lot of great words, neologisms dear to my heart um, for thinking about that. Um, but I also think that responding to that with alignment and obedience, right, isn't really an option for us, right? We, we have to resist in some way. Resistance can't really be futile, but old style resistance probably is. And so Eve Tuck also reminds us that desire interrupts that reproductive and resistance kind of narrative as have the works that we've witnessed today. Um, I think that using, you know, rooting into the planthropocene, um, working the edges, using our peripheral visions, which are honed after all, by our motivations to see around and through and against the non ruderal ecologies that we also simultaneously inhabit um, to interrupt the seamless reproduction of uneven terrain and hostile territories. So these are everywhere, right? I mean, the, the unevenness, the inequity, right? The damage, the trauma, it's all around us. Um, and as Sylvia Winter reminds us, if we continue with the, our old ways of thinking, right? These narratives that are completely just damage centered, uh, then we drift as a species towards an unparalleled catastrophe. So it's a kind of uh, catastrophizing of, of um, that, that kind of thinking that I, that I think with sometimes. And so I wonder about the cyanobacteria, the, the algae, the plants, the sturgeon, right? Um, they help to teach us how to work towards more livable worlds. And I really appreciate um, the works that we witnessed today because I think that they are about flourishing even in the midst of uh, this seeming destruction. They're about resourceful adaptation, et cetera. Um, so the questions that I have about them are really about living that with that, those ambivalences, right? Living, you know, how do we flourish while we know um, that the flames are at our door, um, while we know that um, uh, our affective landscapes uh, are fairly depressing, 
at times and have really affected gener uh, younger generations uh, uh, that are infrastructures are, are crumbling, um, are quite unstable. And um, that what we are all trying to do is make homes in inhospitable environments. So what I'm wondering for each of our speakers is how have you done it, right? How have you um, made solidarities in the midst of the forms of precarity that you're all thinking with and, and living with. How have you made your homes, right, in these inhospitable environments? Um, that is very literal in the, in, in the case of, um, that Bettina brought to us through her work on asylum seekers from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East who find themselves living in abandoned military barracks in the former GDR in the forest, uh, you know, in the midst of these, um, uh, some of the trees of this region of the world are really quite um, amazing. So we're all stranded in a sense. These are worlds of the stranded. Um, and so here we are stranded together. Um, how might you answer um, that kind of question, right? How do you make um, homes and art um, in inhospitable environments? What do you rely on? What are your resources? Thank you for uh, allowing uh, me to ask you uh, that uh, question. I look forward to um, answers. Do you first want um, answers from us or do the different discussants first wanna throw out their Go for it. Go for it now, and then we'll go to other other people. Okay. You want Tiara or Anna? Do you guys want to go first, or I, I can go first? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, thank you so much for bringing up these yeah these very relevant questions to the discussion. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm almost have to um, reply with a little bit of a question as well, or just a little bit of pushback, because I do think it's almost like as, as much as I agree with bell hooks and, and the, what was quoted, I do think it's a bit dangerous to say we shouldn't discuss trauma because I think that we have to keep discussing it as a starting point to remember the we have to remember the atrocities, but also that we have to include the strength in the discussion of that, the strength, the survival, the transformation that comes from discussing this and the endurance and the joy that stems from the survival. Um, and especially with indigenous cultures, um, how all of this is, is layered onto itself. Um, and there's always desire, desire has never stopped, um, but the desire is really only accessible from the processing of the trauma. Um, and, and seeing, um, and also I, th I think um, in terms of, of the old ways of thinking for indigenous folks, for us, those are very powerful because they hold a millennia of cult cumulative knowledge um, that is still growing. So to think of the knowledge really as not old, but alive and living, this living body of knowledge that spans generations that really um, actually uh, are quite advanced um, in the sense, I, what comes to mind is uh, for the Hawaiian people is we, ha we had um, at one point in the world, one of the most advanced hydrological systems called uh, Ahupua'a, which was a land division system that considered um, starting with the, the, the tops of the mountains and the watersheds all the way down to the, the coral reefs and the oceans as, as one um, whole system. Um, and the using just the natural flows of the water to feed all of the crops of the Loikalo. And the stories embedded in the Loikalo are really passed down from generation to generation that uh, include the water systems that include soil systems, you know, the, the, the symbiosis with different bacteria, you know, that was ingrained in this in generations of knowledge um, that are still being 
you know, built on today. So um, honestly, my connection to this knowledge or remembrance of it is, is what kind of keeps me alive and thriving. Um, and, and, and it's been a process for me of like forgetting and remembering, so to speak, as I live in the diaspora um, and then reconnecting to home. Um, and also I, I think home is, is not really a built structure. I think it's a connection to land and it's a, it's a sense of, uh, yeah, the sense of interconnectedness I was saying, but sometimes it goes without language. It's just kind of like being among other species um, and, and an ecosystem. So I'll leave it there <laughs> for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kiara. Uh, I, I really liked um, what you were saying about, um, you know, I, I, I think I really agree with um, Tuck's statement that uh, it's important not to just remain with the trauma and um, focus on, you know, things like ruination and ruins. I think it's something that as an anthropologist, I also, you know, see anthropology, as I said in the talk, kind of becoming a science of ruins. And there's sometimes something kind of um, almost uh, kind of pornographic about it. Um, uh, you know, people talk about ruin porn, etc. And so, so I really, uh, you know, think uh, it's important what uh, Eve Tuck is saying. Um, and I understand, I think we're she's trying to come from, but I think also what Chiara just said, it's also a bit dangerous to not discuss trauma and the violence and to kind of also stick with the violence and kind of, and, and remember it across generations. And I think for me, uh, working in a place like Germany in which I grew up myself, um, I think that's really important as, you know, the generation that uh, experienced the Holocaust and lived through the Holocaust and died through the Holocaust, um, you know, is um, disappearing. I think. Um, I think it's important. I think that's why. I I find it so interesting that this attention to the rural emerged in Germany specifically in the aftermath of of, of fascism and um, and to hold on to that moment and remember that um, and remember it in terms of analyzing the present um, and to kind of um, really pay attention to the layered ways in which history, you know, continues to matter and exert <laughs> uh, its power. And so, so I think that's why the rural is for me and, and thinking about rural plants, you know, as almost these kind of uncanny reminders uh, of the presence of the past. And, and so, but also um, exerting the desire to uh, exceed uh, the landscapes of destruction and violence that we, we inherit. And, um, and so I think that's kind of what fascinates me about the rural that, you know, it's not just a celebration, uh, it's not, you know, because in Germany, the plants coming out of the rubble were actually kind of celebrated as like, oh, there's this new life emerging from the ruins, now let's move on, right? And so that's kind of why I'm so interested in really thinking about the openings uh, of these plants and how can we tell and inhabit a different history and a different presence. Um, and yeah, I don't know whether that really answers all your questions, Nancy, but I think that's kind of what I find, you know, fascinating about the root role in kind of contradict, kind of in uh, opposition almost to thinking about ruins uh, and, and destruction and, and sticking with it. Um, yeah. Thank yes, you. thank, thank yeah. you both. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, know. I don't. I was going to say there's not much more. I don't think I could add on to those eloquent answers. And, and your question was very heavy, but very thought provoking. I actually had like a visceral reaction 
to your words and I felt the hopelessness and um, yeah, no, I mean, I guess that's just there. That's part of it. Um, you can't really erase those things. You can evade them sometimes. Um, sometimes you can focus on the amazing parts. Um, yeah, but what choice do we have? <laughs> Yes, I think that we are uh, very much living um, with these ambivalences, but um, we, uh, the ways in which we incorporate um, histories of trauma um, do vary and um, uh, are not always um, uh, sort of visible in, in a central kind of way. That's why I liked the peripheral um, visions that we, um, you know, got glimpses of. Right. I mean, even with your fish, right? Uh, you, you know, we get we get glimpses of holes um, in in very in very interesting ways. Um, and now I know um, because I know Ellie Irons um, and Jen Whiteman um, well enough to know that they know a whole lot about um, the uh, plants of rural ecologies. Um, I myself have a ter I have an ambivalence to confess in, in uh, handing off to Ellie um, that uh, I was really challenged by her uh, sort of persistent defense of Japanese knotweed, a um, plant that I have tried very hard to eradicate from a stream in Pennsylvania with which I'm very close. And so um, I, I know that some of these tenaciousnesses are beautiful and yet they are also uh, problematic. Um, and so I thought she might want to speak to um, some of those kinds of entwinements. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy, for that introduction. If that's okay, Jenny, I'll jump in here. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly I think knotweed among many of these tenacious root rules is really, really generative to think with and actually embodies a lot of the friction that I think has come across throughout these talks. And that's actually kind of the question my or the direction my question was gonna go in um, is how context specific and um, time specific and natural cultural specific each of our responses to tangling with so-called invasive beings is. Um, and I guess I, I see each of the research practices and the art practices that we've looked at today as um, dealing with what Max was referring to yesterday as um, fraught terrains. Um, and the friction around interrogating and sitting with different conceptions of what good is, um, what's just, what's desirable for our futures. Um, I'm thinking here of the fact that um, we heard that sturgeon in their resurgence are eating mostly so-called invasive species. That's pretty wild. How do we want to think about that relationship? Um, I'm thinking also about um, these undersea cables and plastic invading the earth um, and also connecting us across what, uh, Tiara, you were talking about as the extracta scene after Prabhu Pilar. Um, again, Nancy, you, I, so many, <laughs> so many scenes to think with. And if Natasha was here, like you mentioned, she would be talking to us about the, the planthropocene and uh, a hopeful other era that we can inhabit simultaneously that doesn't have to be time bounded. So can we be in the extractocene and in the planthropocene simultaneously, um, which is an era for plant human solidarity um, that kind of decenters the human to a degree. So I'm thinking about um, these art and research practices as containers for sitting with friction. Um, and I just wanted to hear a little bit. Um, I mean, certainly the thematics are friction inducing. And I think there's good heat that comes from that. And then heat we have to back away from sometimes. But I thought um, as artists and researchers, you might talk a bit about your methodologies a little bit, like how there's space to hold, unlike some of Bettina's stories that have some elements of whimsy and really bring us into um, onto the ground of these gardens. Um, the the statue being stolen and replaced with a bunny, right? Like we have to ha hold a moment of joy and understanding there of like, but then at the same time that we're dealing with these really heavy topics. Um, 
So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your research creates containers for holding and processing what Max was referring to as incommensurate ideas of good, <laughs> if, that, if that resonates with any of you. Um, well, I could try first um, to speak a bit about the sturgeon um, and some of the questions of the diet with invasive species. And thank you, honestly, these questions are, I mean, they're really thought provoking. Um, and all I feel like I can really do is muse a bit. Um, so thank you for giving me something to think about for a while, I think all of you. Um, but in terms of the invasives, you know, I see Paul who has a lot of fantastic questions has one that relates to yours as well um, in terms of these invasive species. Um, why are they eating so many of them? Well, first I would just say what's, what's going on in the habitat? You know, you have a species that's using chemosensory organs to kind of skewed along on the bottom of the lake or the river and kind of suck up food like a vacuum if it seems pretty good. Um, so what that tells me right off the bat is there are a ton of invasive species in those waters, um, you know, and what is kind of the percentage there um, based on availability um, versus preference and those kinds of studies. I don't know of any yet, but I think that that's kind of the wonderful thing about this, this research and, you know, collective research that t transpires over long periods of time and is very clear with citation and referencing what came before it and, and providing the tools and the knowledge for what might come after it. So I think, you know, we're still learning a lot um, and they're really just the last decade or so picking up these studies that they were conducting in the 90s around here. So it just takes a really long time to kind of figure out what all of these things mean. But I think what you can also surmise just you know, without knowing a lot of these details or answering these questions that are opened up by this one answer, um, I think we can, you know, surmise that these fish are adaptable. They're going to use what's available to them. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's how they've survived. That's why they've been here since the last glacial retreat. And if we don't um, treat them as a resource to be exploited, um, if we don't um, destroy their habitat and instead restore it, I think that, you know, we'll be seeing a lot of these species kind of, their numbers go up and, and the balance kind of find its footing again, wherever it's supposed to be. Um, and I know invasive species in our landias, very, very fraught territory. <laughs> One where, you know, I too, with knotweed, have such, such complicated feelings. And I feel, you know, um, a personal affront sometimes with the frivolity of which, you know, people kind of talk about like some of these species in certain environments. So I think the devil's in the details with all of this stuff, right? And, um, you know, in terms of containers, just to wrap it up and then let someone else talk because I'm interested to hear what the others have to say. Um, and in terms of this, you know, joy and life versus this feeling of hopelessness and death, you know, the little baby fingerlings in the museum had to have their dark time and they had to have their light time too. That was necessary to life. So I'll just leave with that and, and thank you for your questions. Yes, maybe I can uh, uh, respond a little bit as well. Um, I think, um, Ellie, thanks so much for your comments. And I really like what you're saying about, um, you know, the friction um, uh, in, in our research or artistic practices and and also the question about how context specific is, is some of this and 
thinking specifically about uh, the ruderal. And I think, um, I think for me, you know, as I have been doing research and working with different communities and also then in the writing up process, I think it's been really important to, um, you know, really pay attention to the details as, as um, uh, Anna just said, you know, the, uh, the devil is in the details. And, and so I think for me, it's really important to kind of do that kind of grounded work of really invoking, you know, people and specific kinds of plants and the land on which these encounters uh, um, is occurring and the histories and the multiple layers of histories of violence and, uh, but also flourishing uh, that it is occurring in. And so, um, so it's really important for me to, to, I think, kind of pay attention to the specificity. And I think, what I really appreciated also about Max's talk yesterday was um, the thought that um, method is a way of being in the world, um, which I thought, you know, is really, you know, it's not just a kind of artistic or research choice that we're doing, but it's also, you know, really about how do we relate with one another and, um, uh, including uh, more than humans. And, uh, and so I think um, for me in, in my writing and research practice, I think that has been really important. How do we not always relate everything back to ourselves as Max said yesterday? Um, I don't know whether this sounds too, um, too abstract now, but I, I, I think that's something that's kind of been important for me. Um, as an anthropologist and uh, as an ethno ethnographer um, and to also uh, really pay attention, kind of thinking about ethics of research, et cetera. You know, I was working specifically with very vulnerable communities and how to then, you know, not produce extractive forms of knowledge. Uh, you know, I had people, you know, kind of also, um, uh, you know, refuse <laughs> wanting to, you know, tell their stories or, you know, go into details about their identities, et cetera, and how to kind of really respond to that and, and hold that and not um, gloss over that um, uh, and really think about ways also of giving back, um, but at the same time, not trying to erase the, the power dynamics that, that are there uh, as one does research. And so I think listening to some of, you know, to all of our talks uh, today, I, I think this, this question of um, care really kind of came up for me again, that again, Max uh, pointed out yesterday about, you know, wanting to unsettle care and forms of care and how, how to do that and how to kind of really be uh, cognizant of the, the fraught terrain in which also care work as researchers, as artists, as scientists um, um, that we're doing. And um, I'd, I'd love to, you know, talk more with Tiara and, and Anna about that, you know, about how, you know, how you guys are thinking about, you know, yeah, Anna, in your case, working with water and with uh, fish, um, you know, I think you talked a lot about, um, about you know, it, it, uh, really acknowledge uh, or like really um, appreciating the fluidity of water and, and, and what it does, but then at the same time, um, you know, water is also fraught with, uh, histories of colonial violence, slavery, et cetera. And so I, I thought it was interesting, you know, that you were working in a border space actually. And I, I would love to hear more about that, how that actually worked out in, in, your, in your research. And then uh, also Tiara, um, I, I thought it was so interesting that you were, you know, looking at the, 
at the melt of plastic and trying to, to do something different with it and kind of um, really pay attention to, um, to the destructive effects. So I, I, I just think it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would love to have more of a conversation, you know, using Ellie's uh, comments to, to kind of think about this kind of care work and, and, and really unsettling also the kind of care work that we're trying to do as researchers or artists, you know, and um, not, not looking at a way at the ways in which it's always fraught. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bettina, to, and Ellie, like, and, and again for the question. Um, I think a lot of amazing things were said. So I just, I, I wanted to kind of piggyback off of the idea um, that you mentioned, Bettina, of method as a way of being in the world or, or that was spoken about um, in yesterday's uh, presentation. Because I, I think a lot about in terms of my methodology, um, in addition to kind of researching articles, um, you know, it's really about embodied research and being kind of um, present in, in a landscape or a specific geography that I am doing work about. And sometimes I forget that. <laughs> and so for instance, uh, when I made the, the augmented reality sculpture that, that uh, was paying homage to Hina Opahala Ko'a uh, related to the coral reefs, I, it was, I, we started when I was off island and we almost completed the work before I had even gone into the ocean and really connected <laughs> with the, um, in the reef system. And, and it wasn't until I went snorkeling and kind of like was really face to face with, with the corals um, off the coast of Oahu and seeing them both, you know, um, and thriving, but also like partially bleached, you know, in this kind of like mixed state of aliveness, uh, but also being in awe of their beauty and also their, you know, the if we're talking about xenophobia that was mentioned or like things that are alien, I think the ocean is, Absolutely that, like a lot of us don't, who, who like often go in the ocean. I, I grew up going in the ocean because the ocean is warm in Hawaii, but like how many of us are actively going in and interacting with different creatures in the ocean if we're not fishing or extracting, right? So um, uh, I think really interacting with these environments that we often are not, that are so alien to us is really a huge part of my research um, and methodology. And, and for me, after going in the ocean and, and kind of inter just viewing uh, the different species, I was able to, to really create the work. And then for something like augmented reality, it's like seeing how people interact with the work. Does it translate? Um, is what is being, what is the transference of knowledge in the participation of this uh, experience? Um, because sometimes I worry about legibility and I worry about the vacuum some, or the, uh, you know, the bubble that we all work in. Um, and how does it, you know, how, did, how do uh, the work we do kind of like move beyond those boundaries? And I, I do really think of, you know, in terms of my work film as like a powerful method of, of being something that can be transmitted uh, as, as this kind of immersive experience uh, um, of knowledge. So I think it's just something to think of, to remember is how, how do these conversations, how do they, they move out into the world because I think they're all really important and needed. Um, on a question for um, Ellie about uh, uh, the, the the sturgeon fish and um, the cyanobacteria, because I know like Erie, if that's the lake that is focused on, has the cyanobacteria blooms, and I'm wondering about the interactions with the sturgeon and how they're affected. Because I was like really wanting to go on a research trip there and just like be among a bloom. Um, and also, I think the recent like push for environmental personhood of like Erie, like how does that all kind of, if, if that um, it comes into play in any of your research and your work? Sorry to diverge. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Did you want to hear from Ali? Um... But no, thank you. I was just, I'm, I'm always listening and then I'm never sure <laughs> if someone's fully done or not, or if I have a freeze. Um, um, 
So talking about embodied experience, and then can you refresh me where we left off? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, sorry. My question was about the cyanobacteria in Lake Erie. And oh, like okay. If there was um, an inter because they have the the blooms that happen there, and how oh, that yeah. it might affect the you know the sturgeon and um, also also if this push for environmental personhood that I know people are trying to get for Lake Erie and if that makes any sort of difference um, and how you see that playing out in your research. Yeah, so the cyanobacteria, I think my understanding is it mostly affects, um, you know, it'll affect the water, the turbidity, how far you can see, but mostly it's kind of toxic for us and dogs and it's a major problem in the Finger Lakes too. Um, as well as in Lake Erie, although the last couple summers, we haven't really had a terrible bloom. I think the last one was like maybe three years ago, but the last two times I've been in the Finger Lakes, I haven't been able to go into Cayuga Lake at all because of the blooms. Um, so just first of all, I loved your pieces and I love Hawaii like so much. It's actually the place that I, as someone that grew up in the Great Lakes, with this understanding of water is like, yes, it's beautiful, but it's for sunsets because it's dangerous and you can't eat the fish. And did it rain? Because if it, if it did, you might not want to go in the water. You know, we have combined sewer overflow problems here, like a lot of old cities throughout the Northeast. So if there's a heavy rain, you'll get the water kind of rushing into the sewers and shooting out into the creeks. And for the sturgeon, that kind of stuff has impacted them quite a lot. And I think um, things like habitat destruction really, really impact them. So in places like the Yangtze River in China, they spend billions a year stocking huge sturgeon, their native species there, back into the water. But because of these dams, they can't get to their spawning um, habitats that they need. And so these have not been as successful um, as other situations. Here, where I live, we have the Niagara River, which has Niagara Falls. So there's a natural barrier. And our two populations are actually separate. And of course, they're genetically related, but they kind of live in different areas and have different habitat and ways. And the Buffalo part, Lake Erie part, Lake Erie is basically a giant puddle, right? Like it's 60 feet deep at the deepest spot or well generally and then there's something like 120 feet somewhere but it's generally it's a tiny puddle and most of the collection of life I found in my research is at the narrowings right at the straits so the Niagara River is not a river it's a strait and on top of all the legacy pollution and all these terrible things collecting there all of the nutrients also collect there so we are on the Atlantic Flyway. We have, you know, birds coming from the Amazon, from the Arctic. We get snowy owls this time of year. Um, and then we have like migratory fish like the sturgeon. But I think the rivers, like the Buffalo River has been deep in 26 feet to enable like freight ships to come through, which is one of the things that's brought in, you know, species like the zebra and the quagga mussels. Um, and the round gobies, they've all kind of come from the ballasts of ships and they've either come through the St. Lawrence Seaway or the Erie Canal or somewhere that was connecting here as a Western terminus. So you kind of see this like witch's brew of all this different like bad and good stuff overlapping here, you know, great nutrients, like great kind of like migratory um, ancient pathways, um, but then like great place for pollution to collect to like Lackawanna where the lake is here is really, 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 really fraught land. Um, you know, growing up around here, you know, my mother died of cancer before I graduated high school. I had lost three friends, um, you know, neurodegenerative issues are a big thing here. Um, so you feel it, it's, it's part of your, your inheritance, not even just if your ancestors are here, just being here and living with, and off of this land and water. Um, so I feel like I went in a giant circle um, around cyanobacteria to say that's, yes, one of many, many issues. Um, but I think it actually affects the fish a little bit less, um, you know, other than like oxygen issues and some other stuff. And in this case, like the, the um, things like the zebra and the quagga mussels, you know, they've actually contributed quite a bit to like a lack of clarity in Lake Erie. So, you know, even with these 
you know, invasive species. And I think, you know, again, diction is important and maybe that isn't the right diction for these species, but I do think you have to look at time scales. When you look at or think about anything from the algae to the sturgeon to um, really any species at all and, and all of them in an ecosystem together. And that's kind of like, um, what are they doing and what amount of time and what else is able to survive? You know, did thank that you. even this come is... close to, thank you. <laughs> that was a beautiful question and a really sloppy answer. That was really great. This is a fabulous conversation. I'm just yeah. gonna jump in and, and ask um, Jen, Jenny Whiteman if you have a question you wanna jump in with, because unfortunately we are running out of time and I wish this conversation could go on for days, but you know, it's not gonna sadly. <laughs> so I don't know if Jenny, you have you wanna ask something or we can just open it up to the floor. It's up to you. Um, Anna, everything is messy, so. <laughs> I think we're dealing with very messy, messy topics here. Um, I just want to thank all of you for your serious playfulness, playful in the sense of rolling with the facts of your perception to document or imagine differently, sort of the dovetailing between perception, conception, and enactment. In Max's talk last night, they said methodology is a way of being in the world, not just doing, and that these methods that we choose to employ is just another way to enact land relations. These can be colonial or anti-colonial. And so my questions to all of you has to do with land relations. In my work, land use and land use change is something we're all having to grapple with now that there are 9 billion human beings on planet Earth and we have climate change. And when I say land, I mean land as geography and land as bodies in that geography that are fleeting agents in that land. And as each of us look back on what we have studied, we have learned some kind of amorphous somethings to think about imagining in the future. And so I have a particular question for each of you. And you know, you may answer them if you're interested or you can go in any direction you would like, but a question of futuring derived from your individual learnings. So Bettina, you introduced the idea of Gake Congo, if I said that right, places built overnight and filling in the gap. Yeah. So for example, New York State has 4 million acres of quote unquote idle, underutilized or former ag land. Of course, this is now most privately owned and New York State is interested in finding ways to incentivize the use of these lands and incentivize these landowners or society at large to either install solar panels, grow new foods to make New York State more food secure, or state, start a reforestation agenda. In your experience of grassroots versus policy in Germany, what thoughts can you share with us on how we might equitably co-author the future of these specific lands that have huge histories and alter alternalities as it relates to the very urgent need to address climate change, or should it be something very different of living in this time to change the path of what our time will be historically? For Anna, Carl Akeley was a late 1800s conservationist who killed animals and taxidermied them so they could be in museums. In his time and in his vision, it was to put these magnificent creatures in museums so the rest of us would have awe and want to protect these lands far away. Of course, we know this has evolved in some of us as having awe and others becoming trophy hunters. At the end of his life, he had great hope for the camera as the non-killing version of his conservation work. I see your work as enacting just that. Given your intimacy of learning with your sturgeon, what is your vision for the next generation of conservation communication? Is this about restoration, co-being, or simply co-evolution? an evolving diversity of livingnesses? What is this method of sharing the land? And for Tiare, just this month in Munich, scientists published an article about injecting cyanobacteria into fish to provide fish low, it, living in low oxygen waters to be able to think and function. I personally have always wanted to be photosynthetic, not just for the oxygen, but so I could be an autonomous person not to have to kill spinach and corn and cows for my sustenance. 
What do you think of this option of contemporary technology to endow each other or other creatures with new capacities such as photosynthesis, this method of endowing bodies and landscapes with new capacities to deal with say, low oxygen conditions? Or is this something that we should wait to happen naturally in some of these low oxygen conditions that have high cyanobacteria and sturgeon? Should I go first because of the chronology or, um, yeah, okay. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for those wonderful comments. I really appreciate your question about um, the futures uh, that we're kind of envisioning to inhabit and the question about equitably inhabiting some of the spaces that we're talking about. Um, and uh, in terms of the the Geche Kondu that I uh, discuss and mention in the in the talk, this is uh, you know comes from a history uh, of rural urban migration in Turkey, and the Geche Kondu have slowly disappeared in in Turkish cities and uh, have been reconstructed with uh, high rises often um, and. Um, I think in 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 Berlin the Geche Kondu is quite unique, <laughs> but I think in terms of thinking about rural spaces um, and you know the kind of uh, movements to preserve them, I think they're very um, ambivalent in 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 Berlin as well itself. Um, I think that um, there's, for example, one. One nature park um, in Berlin that uh, very much includes rural spaces and has um, kind of uh, served to preserve uh, rural vegetation. And uh, you see walking through it, it's the former um, train yard um, that was abandoned after World War II. Uh, and uh, walking through that space. Um, you see signs saying, uh, rural vegetation, do not touch. <laughs> and, um, and so the rural is kind of being, you know, both conserved, but also um, curate, very much curated there. Uh, there are landscaping practices that specifically try to protect the rural vegetation in, in this particular park. And, and I think also there is very much so a commodification uh, of some of the, you know, abandoned spaces and um, and uh, what might one might call rural spaces happening in Berlin as we speak, you know. So so it's not that the that rural ecologies are kind of immune to that at all. And so I think um, in terms of thinking about how to, you know, more equitably inhabit um, these spaces. I think there, there is are a series um, of, you know, I think projects that I see emerging in Berlin that do really amazing um, work in the community. Um, uh, there's one garden in Kreuzberg near actually the Geche Kondu um, where there is a lot of, um, land grab happening at the moment. And, um, you know, um, a lot of these formerly kind of public common lands are being privatized. And so uh, people are actively engaged in struggles to preserve some of these spaces for community engagement and for, for example, urban gardening, but also for creating a space for people who live in the neighborhood uh, uh, and, and gather. And so, um, not sure whether that really does justice to your question, but I don't want to take up too much time. So thanks for, for that question. Thank you, Bettina. That was lovely. Um, Jennifer, do you mind please reminding me um, 
I know I came up next in the lineup, but can you please re-ask? Um, and I'll try and be brief, um, but brevity is, you know, the soul of wit. So I'm, I'll try and cut myself. <laughs> I, I was just asking, thinking about, um, as you think about your relationship to the sturgeon and how you've been sort of co-inhabiting a space with them and documenting them sort of in a as hands-off way as you possibly can, sort of imagining like, where are we going? Uh, where can you imagine us going in this co-conservation, co-preservation, co-excitement about mutation and diversification, like how, and is it about restoration? Are we striving for restoration or are we striving for some other way of being in the, in space, say as in contrast with historic conservation practices where mm -hmm. we would kill animals and stick them in museums, right? Like as we move forward, how do we, how do we imagine, like, is it that we take kids out in the water so that they have firsthand experience or is that a bad idea? Like, how, how do we become more sensitive to those that live around us that are not human? Thank you. Um, that's a great question and, and one that I'm constantly asking myself. Um, you have to assume sometimes you're insensitive, you walk on plants, right? Um, you scare up birds or other animals without knowing it, um, but that's it was so beautifully put. Thank you so much. And Bettina brought up some points that made me think about some local examples kind of here. So for me personally, like I do believe in and want to see restoration. Um, I think restoration can come in a lot of forms. Some of it's just like leaving it alone and letting nature do most of the heavy lifting and then guiding some of that, I think, um, you know, and I shy away from kind of treating our waterscape here as, you know, a ruin or romanticizing or problematizing that um, because I like to think about it as what it really is, which is part of a larger habitat and a key location on part of a larger habitat. So right here, right now, um, our outer harbor which is basically the point where Lake Erie turns into the Niagara Strait. It was, you know, really, really heavy industry for a long time. Um, and then really the St. Lawrence Seaway cutting off the Erie Canal kind of, I think, saved us ecologically. Cause then we started to have, you know, these monolithic corporations leave these areas crumble um, and fold. And yes, we had ruins for a while, but we also had people like leaving the land alone um, and trees able to go grow and birds able to leave seed. And, you know, it's not to say we didn't get quite a mix. We have a lot of Phragmites. We have a lot of knotweed here. Um, there's all sorts of invasive species, um, just to use that term as shorthand. Um, not without knowledge of, of how problematic it could be. Um, but, you know, I do, I see how restoration does work. I see how leaving a buffer zone at the water, at the coast does work. Fight over mediation can do a lot of work. That's also not to say that remediation isn't necessary. If you have a hot spot and a way and a place to put that, I think you need to kind of do that. I don't think it goes in someone else's backyard. But I think that there is really interesting technology now, really interesting studies, everything from mycology to bacteria to, that eat plastic. And I think there are others here that could clearly speak a lot more articulately about plastics. But um, yeah, I think I do think restoration is important. I think when you mess something up, anything, you take responsibility for that mistake. And even if that's my ancestor's mistake, even if that's your ancestor's mistake, it, it doesn't matter. We're all here, we're right now, you know what I mean? And I think that um, we still have an opportunity um, to kind of restore some, some of the balance. I don't think once a baby is born, you can put it back into a womb, right? So I don't think we'll be a return to this idyllic past. I don't know if there ever was one. I think that nature is, is beautiful, but it's, you know, it is life and death. Um, it's, it's all those things at once. Um, so I don't know, did that even come close to answering their, your question? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking it. Uh, 
Hi. Um, yeah, a very provocative question um, in terms of um, the, the injecting cyanobacteria in, or photosynthetic bodies creating uh, photosynthetic human bodies. It's something I actually love to think about and I'm not sure, yeah, if you watch all of uh, the short film that I presented in with cyanovisions, it's, um, it's suggested, <laughs> but um, it's actually, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Christina Agapakis and her work. She actually did try to um, alter mammalian cells by um, having that, you know, with, with uh, to make them photosynthetic, so to speak, and was not successful. <laughs> so I'm not sure if it's actually possible, but I love the idea of, of transgenesis, uh, putting attributes from one species into another if we're thinking about more regenerative futures and existences. So, you know, harvesting light, right, for energy would be great <laughs> through our skin. Um, I guess the controversial bioethics type of things that come up are like, well, what happens to the germline once you've genetically altered a uh, species on an embryonic level? Um, and how does that continue in the wild? And, and what are the implications of that, right? Um, and how will that affect kind of the uh, the future of, of different species moving forward and then everything they interrelate with. Um, and then it, it provoked another thought around uh, another controversial idea, which is assisted evolution. Um, and I like to think that um, in certain cases, it, it's kind of a, it, it would be really great to employ this and for it to be successful for spe specifically bring, bring it back to coral reefs. So um, at, at UH Manoa, they are, and I think in Australia, they're researching super corals and how to make corals more adaptive to the rising temperatures and acidity in the oceans, right? Um, and that would be amazing because the you know half the Great Barrier Reef is 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 gone basically. So like, how do we how do we bring back the corals? But it's tricky because with these symbiotic systems, uh, the coral and the zooxanthellae, right? It's once those are disrupted, these are like millions years old mutualisms. Um, so it's really difficult to restore this balance even with assisted evolution. But I, I personally think it, it, I'm, I'm on the side of, 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 of like, I'm, I'm, I almost want to do a project about this because I think it is really interesting and, and something that's worth, um, you know, taking a chance at if, if we're going to um, help, you know, if, if we're gonna use technology to assist the re regeneration of species, you know, let's try. <laughs> I hope that, yeah, answered the question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, I really love this conversation. I feel really, um, my mind is like, blown open, but so is my heart. So I really, I really am feeling very um, full from today. And I really thank you all, Tiare and Anna and Bettina for your incredible presentations and answers here. And then also to Nancy and Ellie and Jenny for your really provocative, thoughtful questions. Um, super great conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you.